We're good. Good. So are you seeing just the slide or is it like all of the other stuff too? Um, everything else. Gotcha. How about now? Perfect. Cool. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jonathan Larson. I'm an extension entomologist for UK. Uh, today, I was asked to talk just a little bit about with you about two insects that are kind of making their springtime appearance here in Kentucky. Uh, we're going to talk about the differences between ants and termites. So these are very different insects. They are often kind of conflated together. Uh, but they present different issues to people. And I just kind of wanted to show the differences between them here this afternoon, because they are pretty unique organisms. So then when they get confused with each other, it often happens during kind of the mating period time for them, which is often in this spring kind of wet season that we have here in Kentucky. And it boils down to the fact that both of these types of insects are social. So they have large colonies, and these colonies, they have winged reproductives. And I'll get into this in more detail, but these insects are different than a lot of other bugs in that they live communally, they have overlapping generations, and they kind of have divisions of labor. And one of the divisions that they have is a reproductive cast. So a group of insects whose sole job is to mate and then to go elsewhere and start a new colony with more workers and so, uh, other social aspects of the colony. So these winged reproductives for ants and termites, they look very similar when they're in flight. Uh, they're often found around lights, particularly at night. And then when people see one or the other, they may freak out that they have termites when really they're seeing ants. Uh, they may believe they have ants when they have termites because when they're flying around, they look almost identical in color and shape. It's when we get up close to them that we can start to parse out who we're looking at. Uh, and I'll show you some of the ways that we do that here in a little bit. Ants and termites are pretty dramatically different types of insects. If we were going to kind of go with the entomology of them, when we look at ants, they're a part of a, a distinct group of insects that we call the hymenoptera. Uh, that's the ants, bees, wasps, and sawflies. And then the termites, they have their own group that they're a part of, which we'll talk more about here in a second. Uh, not only are they a part of these different orders of insects, but they look different upon close inspection. Their bodies are shaped kind of differently. And this comes to play because they have very different roles that they fulfill in the environment. When we're talking about ants, we're talking about some of our greatest predators in the insect world. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Jurassic Park, but you know the raptors that run around and kind of talk to each other and work together to take down prey. The ants are very similar to that. Ants in these large numbers, they're able to take down things many times their size and collect bits of them for food. The image that you see on the left here, these are ants that have taken down a, uh, a German cockroach, or actually an American cockroach, now that I look at it closer. And this is a huge bug uh, compared to them in, in relative size comparison, but they are able to overwhelm it and then get on top of it and kill it and then start sawing pieces of it off to take home to feed to one another. So they're really good at doing that. Ants are, uh, they're helpful because they, they help to kill things like white grubs in the land, lawn and landscape. They kill a lot of caterpillar pests that we deal with. They're often suppressing these pests to levels that uh, are otherwise unproblematic for us. So they're really great at that. They're also scavengers. Ants are good at finding food in various areas. This is when they become a bigger problem for humans, frankly, is when they start to find those crumbs uh, that your kid left out, uh, when they find the open can of dog food, when they find the trash that's kind of been left outside uh, unattended to, they're going to start to get into these things. And then they look at your house and they realize this place is full of food. It's full of water. Uh, and they may start using that as a resource. So that's kind of the role that they play in the environment. Termites, on the other hand, they're decomposers. Uh, they are humble breakers down of material that accumulates in the forest. We'll talk more about them here in a moment. But yeah, they're out there looking for this rotten wood, typically, uh, things that are dead and dying because they're helping to return those nutrients to the soil. Very natural part of the forest ecosystem. 
Uh, it's when they start to discover our homes and our structures that they become a bigger problem. So they're very different in anatomy. They're very different in terms of how we classify them. And they're very different in terms of what role they play in the environment. When we look closely at termites, they are related to cockroaches. So they're a part of what we call the order Blatodia. Blatodia is just a fancy Greek word for cockroach. It used to be that termites and cockroaches were separated into their own family or into their own orders. But uh, in recent times, some genetic evidence has revealed that essentially termites are fancy cockroaches. Cockroaches that a long time ago uh, ended up figuring out how to decompose wood uh, thanks to some different gut symbionts that are in their stomachs. They're able to actually break down and digest that cellulose. And then over time, they became specialists on that. And as they specialized, it, it was better to specialize and have specific workers and specific reproductives. And they branched away from the other cockroaches. But if you look at them genetically, they're very similar to your German roaches, your Oriental roaches, your American cockroaches uh, uh, on that genetic scale. The big differences, of course, are size and coloration between the other types of roaches uh, and then the role that they play in the environment. They are both cryptic. Cockroaches like to hide. Termites like to hide. Termite colonies, when they build them, they're down in the soil. They're not nesting in the trees per se. They will expand their nest into dead trees and logs that are on the ground or into your home. But those are kind of satellite areas to the main colony, which will actually be in the moist area down in the soil. They need a high moisture content. They're very susceptible to drying out. If termites are exposed to UV light, if they're exposed to the air, they often start to suffer pretty quickly uh, and they will perish not long after. They need very specific temperatures, a very specific humidity in order to survive. The ones that you're looking at here on the screen are very representative of what I think is the classic conception of a termite. If you look at a termite from the top, uh, and if you look at its head and then butt, if you turn them over so the head was towards the ground, they look kind of like an exclamation point. The head is the area with the antenna extending off of it. Termites are also kind of a white color, which is different compared to other insects. Uh, if you start to look across the whole colony into the different casts, there are some differences in what you'll see. A colony is going to contain reproductives. So the reproductives in this case are a king and a queen. This is unique amongst social insects. We don't normally see kings. Uh, we don't see them, the males stick around for very long. But with termites, there is some differentiation there where we might see them uh, persist for a little bit of time. The queen is the one that's the most important. And she's that big, kind of plump, sausagey looking female reproductive that you see here. Uh, they are going to be around for an extended period of time. Termite queens can live multiple years. And their sole job is to make more workers, make more soldiers, and to make the next generation of reproductives. So she just lays eggs all day long. That's part of why she has this big sort of distended abdomen that you see here. If you go to tropical areas or if you go to, to other areas of the world, termites can look quite a bit different uh, and they can actually live a lot longer. There are termite queens in Africa. Uh, if you've ever seen those big, tall termite chimneys that they have on that continent, the queens that live inside of there, they can be up to 20 years old in some cases, uh, the longest lived insects in the world. So those reproductives have a very specific job. They rely on the workers for the most part in order to have the rest of the jobs in the colony be done. Uh, the workers are the ones that we are most likely to encounter. They're about an eighth of an inch long, creamy white color. And then termites across the board, their antenna are, are semi-unique. Uh, they have what we call filiform antenna. So it's all about the same width from tip to head. Uh, but if you look closely at their antenna, they're almost beaded in appearance. Uh, we sometimes say it looks like a rosary bead. Um, or beads of water kind of collecting together. It's a little different than what we see with other filiform antenna, which are more canister-like. Uh, so these are slightly beaded. The workers are the ones you're most likely to see. There are soldier termites that defend the colony. The difference there is that the head is more rectangular uh, and darker in color if you compare it to the worker. And then they also have bigger mandibles, bigger jaws in the front that they're gonna use to defend the nest. Uh, this can help you to differentiate between the casts. At a certain time of the year, usually in the spring, the termites will produce a reproductive swarm. Uh, when the swarms occur, the reproductives are winged. 
and they're dark in color. So if you look, it looks almost black or dark brown. They have these wings that cover the abdomen. This is the stage that gets most confused for an ant when we're looking at termites. We only have one species, major species, I should say, uh, group here of termites in Kentucky, and we call them the subterranean termites. There's a couple of different kinds of subterranean termites, uh, but for the most part, we just kind of lump them together because they behave very similarly. If you go further south from Kentucky, if you get into states uh, down in a more tropical region like Florida and Louisiana, uh, even down into Alabama, and Mississippi and those places, they have problems with things like dry wood termites, which can exist uh, in drier wood without the aid of mud, which we'll show here in a second, become a much bigger problem. Uh, they also have Formosan termites, which have weird soldiers that can shoot acid out of their head and kinds of stuff like that. Uh, we don't have those here as far as we've been able to tell up until now. Um, we haven't had a, a colony located within the state of Kentucky. Uh, so we are only dealing with the subterranean termites. Subterranean tells you everything about kind of where they're going to be living. They live underground in the moist soil. They forage and utilize uh, dead and dying wood that's kind of in the vicinity of the nest. Usually there needs to be strong soil to wood contact in order for this to occur. For them to discover it, they need to, to have their colony kind of be able to touch it. In the forest, this is very natural. This is a part of the decomposition process. So a tree falls over in the woods. If nobody's around to hear it, it still makes a noise uh, and it still makes a great food resource for these termites as it's touching the ground. If a termite colony is in the vicinity, they'll be able to start to extend their nest towards this new food resource. And then they'll start to move parts of their nest into it and they'll start to forage on the woody material inside. The problem for humans becomes we use many of the same materials that the termites use for food as building material. So we take dead wood and then we construct all of these magnificent structures out of it. It also sometimes touches soil when we do that, uh, either in the construction process or even post-construction. There can be access points for them to come up out of the ground and get closer to wood, and they're able to utilize that as well. It's not their fault that we use their favorite food as uh, something to build our home in. They're just taking advantage of it. But it does create a large industry of pest management in the country. I think we spend about $3 billion every year in this country managing for termites. Uh, they don't want to be exposed to the outdoor elements. So they're not just out foraging kind of above ground like an ant would looking for your house to move into. They need to be able to construct a mud tube from their home to the food resource. The mud tubes are sometimes under a log or under a rock outside, but when we start to have them interact with people, we can sometimes use this as a symptom to know that we're dealing with termites. So if you look here, there's a termite mud tube on a cinder block foundation on the left. Uh, so they've built this from the ground up to a, 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 re a wood resource that's inside of this home. Sometimes they do it inside, of the construction so we can't see it. Uh, sometimes this is in below ground insulation. If you have a basement and you have foam insulation sort of surrounding it, it, they can live inside of that. They can use that as a bridge to get to the wood. But these mud tubes are very symptomatic. Uh, they help us to know when termites are around. They're often discovered uh, during the springtime when we're cleaning things out. You may start to move and, and clean around the, the base of your home and you might notice this mud tube. Uh, if you're doing deep spring cleaning, like you're getting under the house and looking for things, you may end up encountering them. They may also be discovered during routine repairs for other things. If you've got a leak, um, if you have anything else that's going on kind of below the house, if you have to get into the crawl space or go into these kind of otherwise inaccessible areas, sometimes the mud tubes are discovered then. Depending on how long the termites have been active, they may have caused more damage or less. Uh, termites are not fast about this. If you get a termite problem, we're not talking about your house being devoured like in a Tom and Jerry cartoon and then falling in on you within a matter of days or weeks. We're talking about years of accumulated damage that starts to become problematic. The other symptoms that you might find if you're dealing with a termite problem can include things like their frass pellets. We see those here on the left. So when they are... are feeding, they're pushing things out from where they're at. And you'll see these piles, most often accumulating. This one's in a windowsill. 
You might see them uh, by the baseboards on the floor. You may see them in a basement or a crawl space. It is very pellet-like. Um, it's not pepper-like in, in feel. It does feel like a really small, hard plastic ball, kind of when you touch it. Uh, and they're colored like wood since that's what they're made of. Uh, you'll also look around and notice the damage that they're producing. And termites feed, they're not consuming all of the wood. If you look on the right here, you see they're kind of creating this almost ragged appearance. They're chewing through the cellulose. They're chewing through all of this woody material. They're leaving layers behind, and it looks kind of ragged and ratty. The other thing that contributes to that is they need this to stay moist and at a certain humidity, and so they pack it with mud as well. So as you kind of pick through the damage, this muddy material will start to crumble apart and fall out as well. Uh, this is all good indicators that you're dealing with a termite problem. As I've kind of alluded to, springtime is a very common time for homeowners to start worrying about termites. Um, it's a very common time for us on the entomology de in the entomology department to start getting questions because people may not have noticed those mud tubes, uh, but they may start to notice reproductive swarmers. So they'll have their porch light on at night or a security light on, and all of a sudden it's swarmed with these strange looking kind of winged organisms just in this big cloud. They may catch some of them and then take a closer look. Here are some live termite swarmers here. Again, kind of an exclamation point appearance if you look from the tip of the wings to the head. Their wings are, are interesting looking compared to other insect wings. I'll show some other close-ups. Uh, but these are sometimes the, the common indicator for people that, oh my goodness, something weird is happening. Uh, I need to get this identified. And then following that, there may be subsequent dis uh, discovery of the mud tubes. You may go outside and start flipping over logs or moving outdoor objects around. You're getting ready for summer. So you're setting the yard up, and as you start to flip over paver stones or log piles or getting things ready for the garden, you might see termites crawling in and around there. Uh, you might see those workers, uh, and that could be another indicator. When we talk about those reproductives, they're very visually similar to ants. So here's an older diagram showing the ant versus termite reproductive. In flight, it's very difficult to tell the difference between these, uh, nigh on impossible. You do have to catch them and then take a closer look with a magnifying glass or a hand lens in order to make the differentiation. So if we look at an ant, ants have kind of a snowman-like body. Uh, I would describe it, if you look at them from the top down, the head, thorax, and abdomen are very distinct with ants, and you kind of have this curvature between each, and so it gives it almost this snowman-like profile. Termites, on the other hand, they don't have any of those constrictions between body sections. Instead, they're very sausage shaped. Their head and their thorax and their abdomen are all vaguely the same width. They kind of taper off towards each end. So if you, you know, think of the, the biggest, juiciest bratwurst that you've ever seen, throw some wings and legs on it. That's kind of what a termite looks like when you're staring at them from the top down. Some other key differences include the antenna. I already mentioned that termites have those rosary bead or beaded like antenna. Ants have very different antenna. We have, we call them elbowed antenna. So ant antenna are always kind of held out. Like somebody is saying, the field goal is good for the wildcats. Uh, they just kind of bent in the middle and they have this part that extends out uh, and there's this elbow piece in the middle or, an, or almost like a knee joint uh, kind of, it bends and, and looks like that. Here's another diagram just trying to show some of that. The other reason that I like this one is it shows some of the differences in the wings. So flying ants, when they have their wings on, the wing in front is much longer than the wing in the back. They have unequal wing lengths. So that's a, a hallmark of the Hymenoptera. The front wing is much larger than the back wing. With termites, their wings are equal in length. Um, this is one of the things that's very classic with them is that we have these two long wings that extend out from the body. Their wings are also filled with more veins. So they're kind of cloudier in appearance or harder to see through when compared with a reproductive ant. Again, these are just some things that you can do very quickly in the field uh, for identification or if it comes into an office. These are the kinds of things that I would be looking for. In terms of termite management, the bad news that I share with this is it usually is going to involve the help of a professional pest control company. I'm not sure what all of the options are kind of in the Letcher County and, and Harlan County area for this, 
but I'm guessing that there are some termite control companies uh, that are available for hire that will be able to come in and do a really thorough inspection. They'll be able to figure out where the termites are. You know, if you're seeing them in the landscape, it is good to have somebody come and inspect to see, have they made it to the house yet? Are prior treatments at the house working? Um, are they being repelled from the home? Do you really have a problem? If you just find some in a firewood pile outside of the house, it doesn't necessarily mean you have them in the home. They just found your pile of firewood. If that pile of firewood is touching your house, it is good to have somebody come and take an inspection uh, just to make sure that nothing has made its way into the structure, get down into those kind of hard to reach places. After that, they're going to be able to provide a more thorough management of potential issues than we can just as individuals, as homeowners. They have access to chemistry and application methods that we just don't have if you're a general citizen. That's going to come down to a couple of different things. A termite treatment can be a liquid or granular barrier that's put, put around the perimeter of the home. Uh, sometimes it's just a spray. There are at-home sprays that you can use in that fashion. Your mileage will vary with those depending on how well you apply them and how well you follow the label. If the professional comes in, they may offer to do that but much more likely what they're going to offer to do is to do a drill and treat. So they'll go through with a high power drill and then in the, the cement areas of your home and other areas, they will drill into it. They will pour a chemical solution in and this will afford you protection for an extended amount of time. These are termiticides. They've been evaluated heavily for safety uh, to make sure that they're not going to cause problems in the home for people and pets. Um, they're very effective. They work for long periods of time. Uh, you may have to get it replenished in a few years if you continue to have termite issues. That would be one option. The other option is the use of baits near structures. So termite baits or bait stations, as you see here, they're inserted into the ground. They may contain pieces of wood or cardboard. The one here on the right, I think it looks like it has some cardboard rolled up in there. They'll eat that as well. These can be monitoring tools. They can tell professionals that termites are in the area. They may also be baited with an insecticide that's in the material that's inside of the station. And so they take that home and they feed it to one another. Termites, uh, they have a very strange feeding process that involves eating each other's fecal material uh, in order to pick up gut symbionts that are going to help them to break down the wood. So they're just like shoveling poop into their kid's mouth pretty frequently. Uh, and when they do that, they can pass on these insecticides as well, and we can wipe out the whole colony. So that's another option for pest control in terms of these. But both of these are going to be very professional. They're not going to be something that you can do necessarily on your own. There can be a bill associated with this, of course, but you do want to consider it just because we're talking about something that's literally eating you out of house and home. I did want to throw these up. These were produced by our urban entomology team here on campus. We have two fact sheets. If you hold your phone up to these QR codes with the camera app open, it should be able to read the QR code and then take you to each of these fact sheets. You may also be able to obtain them at your local extension offices, but we have in fact 604 and 605. Uh, 604 is termite control for homeowners and then 605 is protecting the home from termites. These are just some tips for hiring a company, things that you can expect, uh, and also with protecting your home from termites, uh, things like how, where to put firewood, how to prevent the, attracting the termites to your property. I'll leave those up here for just a second as I take a sip of water in case anybody wants to screen grab them. That's the termites. With that, I'm gonna move into talking a little bit about the ants. So ants are a part of an entirely different order of insects. We call them the hymenopterans. Hymenoptera means membranous wing. It's just talking about the wings that things like ants, bees, wasps, and sawflies have. So ants, they're more closely related to the bees and wasps. As with these other insects, they're social. So we have reproductives and we have division of labor. We see typically with these insects a waste. Some people call it the wasp waste. Uh, but that also sort of connotates uh, a human element. Some people use that to talk about fashion. This is just a constriction in insects between the thorax and the abdomen. So you kind of have this thin bridge that connects those two areas. And ants, bees, and wasps have that. Many of these insects are capable of stinging. If we're talking about bees, wasps, and ants, 
If they are a worker, they're going to be equipped with a stinger. All of them, uh, even the reproductives can sting in most cases, but the ants and bees and wasps, the workers are the ones that are most likely to use that stinger. So it's a modified egg laying device that's hooked to a venom sack so they can deliver venom from their body into your body uh, and try to communicate how displeased they are with you. Uh, this group is the one that's famous for having that. When we look at ant colonies and their casts, there are some similarities to what we see with termites, but I would argue there's a lot less specialization uh, between soldiers and workers. These are carpenter ants that you're looking at here. Carpenter ants are one of the groups that we do see some specialization. And carpenter ants, the big worker that you see at the top, that's a major worker. We have a media worker in the middle and then a micro or minor worker in the smallest uh, category here. They'll have different roles. The major ones will mo more likely perform defensive things in the colony, but they can also be used to chew new areas of the colony because they have really big, powerful jaws. Whereas these smaller ones, they may be more likely to forage or to tend to the young. The reproductives in this case, again, very similar to the termites. We have a big queen that is going to live in the colony that can live multiple years. Unlike termites, these males that we see here, which are the smaller winged ones up here, they don't live very long. They come out, they mate with the new queens, and that pretty much takes care of them. They don't survive much past that initial mating. They'll perish, and then she'll fly off, land in a new area, chew her own wings off, and start laying her eggs so she can have her own worker group that starts to take care of her. So that's kind of how work uh, uh, originates in the ant colony. All of the workers in this case are female. Uh, so the colony is mostly female throughout most of the season. With ants, we have quite a few in and around the landscape. Uh, we can find several that get into the house or get into different parts of our, our ornamental areas. The two that I'm probably going to focus on the most here today are the carpenter ants and then the odorous house ants. These are the two that we're getting questions about already uh, at this time of the year. Uh, this is a very common time of the year to see ants uh, pop up for people. They typically start in March. That's when most people uh, or many people will start to notice them. But ants will then continue throughout the summer. We even have some that pop up in late fall and early winter. That's usually the carpenter ants. With ants, the one thing that I want to throw out there is if you're seeing individual workers, just one or two, you can crush those. And sometimes you crush the scout. Uh, or the one that's coming in to try and figure out, hey, what's in here? What can we eat? What can we drink? Um, if you crush those, they will not be able to communicate the location back to the main colony. So you may see fewer of them. Uh, if you do a lot of sanitation, if you do cleaning and clear out any uh, crumbs and messes that they might be able to take advantage of. If you also take care of moisture issues, leaks, if you don't leave lots of water in the sink, um, if you take care of your dog and cat food and water bowl areas and just make sure that they're kind of tidy, the ants will be less attracted to the place as well. They'll be like, this place stinks. There's nothing to eat or drink. Let's go somewhere else. If you have a lot of ants coming into the home, though, if you see kind of a conga line of them coming in through the window, uh, down to your sink or down to your sugar pot or what have you, and you kill all those workers, you've really only treated the symptoms. If you spray all those ants, there's still a trail into your home. Ants are very famous for laying trail pheromones down to communicate with each other where food resources are. Other workers are going to show up in the near future and start that process over again. In order to get rid of ants, we have to control the whole colony. We have to try and destroy it. And I'll show some ways that we do that with house ants and carpenter ants here in a second. If you're ever interested in ant identification, it really comes down to what we call the thorax and the pedicel. The thorax of ants can either have humps in it or it can be smooth. And then the pedicel, uh, this is an area between the thorax and the abdomen. If we look there, there's a node. So a node is a thorn-like object that pokes out. Some ants have nodes, other ants don't we put these two pieces together to figure out what species we're looking at. So to kind of highlight that, I'll start with carpenter ants. These are some of the largest ants we deal with in and around homes. They can get up to half an inch long. If we look at the top of their thorax, it's smooth. There are no humps. It looks like the top of a football helmet, frankly. 
And then if we look between the thorax and the abdomen, there's one big node on the pedestal. It's very obvious to see. These ants also have some behavioral traits if you see them alive. Uh, they often keep their antenna kind of close cropped to the head like you see in this illustration. And their eyes are kind of small relative to their head. Those are, are, are kind of anecdotal things. This is the, the main way that we identify carpenter ants. We look at the thorax and that pedestal. Uh, carpenter ants are most often solid black. So you see that there on the left. Uh, they're very dark in color. There are two-tone species that are black and red. There are also red carpenter ant species. We have all of them here in Kentucky. No matter what color they are, uh, they are gonna be a pest potentially, especially if they get into the home. We get calls in early spring with carpenter ants out foraging. Then we also get them in fall and early winter when people start to notice them more uh, as the season winds down. They are associated with wood, they're a structural pest, but unlike termites, they're not actually eating your home. Uh, they don't eat wood. Termites have those things in their guts that help them to digest all that hard to eat cellulose. Carpenter ants don't. Carpenter ants forage for other insects, uh, sugary materials, protein sources out in nature. They just live in wood. They excavate it for their nest. Typically, they're in a tree. So they're in a dead part of a tree. All trees have spots on them that are dead or decaying uh, due to a variety of factors. That's usually where they want to start. They can also end up in our structures, especially if trees are touching the home. Uh, if a branch kind of comes down and touches your roof, or if you've had uh, moisture damage, flood damage, uh, if you have a leak in the home, if you have a hole in your roof, uh, anywhere that's kind of damp, carpenter ants are able to start there, that pulpy area. They're able to excavate it out before they move deeper into the drier wood. When they go through, they're not packing with mud, so we don't see any mud within these tunnels that we see here. So it's much drier and neater. Uh, and then they kind of have these rounded edges to where they chew. It looks much less ragged when compared to termites. So here's a kind of side-by-side -side comparison. So no mud, uh, there may be some sawdust-like material in there, but I think you can see we have these kind of uh, almost rounded edges, kind of tunnel-like look to the wood on the inside as the carpenter ants go through it. Whereas with the termites, again, it's more of this ragged thing. It's full of mud all over the place. Uh, so there are some key differences between how they interact with the wood. These also produce some other signs and symptoms that we can look for. They produce sawdust piles. So there'll often be a little hole in a piece of wood, uh, like in a windowsill um, or up by the ceiling. And then there's a little, or by a baseboard, you'll see this pile of sawdust-like shavings. And you'll also see dead ants and other dead insects in there. People see foraging workers in their home. Uh, sometimes in the spring, we see these winged reproductives, which again, look very similar to the termites. The other thing I'll throw out there is in the fall and winter, people end up finding carpenter ants sometimes because they're sitting and it's very quiet and they'll hear a crinkling noise. And at first they'll think that they're going kind of crazy. It sounds like somebody has a bunch of saran wrap and they're just kind of like working it together near uh, where you're sitting. And then you'll get close to your wall and you may be able to pinpoint it. Those are the ants as they crawl through, they sometimes drum on the wood. Uh, and when they do that, it makes this crinkling noise. It's a communication tool. You can also hear they're chewing. Uh, so you're not losing your mind. There are bugs in the walls in this case, uh, and you'll have to help get them out of there. If you want to find out where they're living, you can follow worker ants at night. They're typically nocturnal. You can follow them from where you've discovered them back to the nest, uh, and then maybe get the nest treated or treat it yourself. If you're having difficulty with uh, locating the workers, and then following them, you can put index cards down on the floor where you've seen ants, carpenter ants, bait it with honey. They'll come and get that honey. And then as soon as you get kind of a group of them doing that, you can follow that group back to the nest. Carpenter ant control, again, is contingent on getting to the queen. We have to destroy her, not just her worker force. Treating nests directly by drilling into them and pouring a powder insecticide or spraying in there, that is something that can be done. Again, usually by a professional, but sometimes on your own, if you're willing to take the risk. There are also newer uh, carpenter ant baits that are out there. This is Max Force, just one example. I believe that this is for uh, purchase by homeowners. Um, it's a substance that you would put little dots out 
And then the carpenter ants pick those up, feed it to everybody back home and wipe the whole colony out. There are other more generic varieties that are at the store. You do need to look at the packaging and make sure it says carpenter ant somewhere. Not all ant baits are attractive to carpenter ants. These are specially formulated to do so. So you need to make sure carpenter ants are listed. The other ant that I wanted to talk about are the odorous house ants. These are also sometimes known as sugar ants. They're smaller, particularly compared to carpenter ants, but they have an insatiable sweet tooth. You may know somebody like this in your personal life that just wants to eat cupcake after cupcake. Uh, these are very similar to that. So they're about an eighth of an inch long, dark brown in color. Uh, they usually hold their antenna out like you're seeing here. When we look at them, their thorax has a dip in the middle under the microscope, we would notice that. And then their abdomen has this kind of overhang that almost touches the thorax and it hides their node. Uh, the main way that we identify carpenter ant or uh, odorous house ants though, is by smell. The name is not just for show, they do smell quite bad. Uh, particularly when crushed. So if you ever see an uh, entomologist like squishing bugs and then huffing their thumbs, uh, they're trying to figure out what ant they're looking at. Odorous house ants are often said to smell like blue cheese or rotten coconut. I myself have never encountered a rotten coconut, so I can't speak to that. I do see the blue or I do smell the blue cheese kind of angle. It is kind of that like musty uh, kind of fungal odor. Uh, I think they smell like odorous house ants. It's a very distinct smell. Once you experience it for once, uh, for one time, you will never forget it and you'll be able to smell it again in the future. The other smelly ants that we have include the citronella ants, which are more orange, but they have a much more pleasant odor, uh, almost citrus-like in flavor. These are nuisances. They don't do damage to our structures. Uh, they do stress a lot of people out because they're coming into the house in high numbers. They're getting in food boxes. We've seen them in cabinets, things that don't get used very often, uh, things that have been closed up due to people moving out or uh, uh, snowbirding elsewhere and then coming home. Uh, they also just come in and look for moisture. And so people don't like that. They, they want to be able to dictate who their house guests are. And it doesn't include ants on the guest list. This usually starts in March and April. They can be found throughout the summer coming into the home. If you want to control these, they are typically going to go to sweet ant baits. That's going to be taro for most people. Taro ant baits are widely available. Odorous house ants go to them very quickly. They will clear them out and take it home. It works over the course of about seven to 10 days. So you may continue to see ants for about a week. Don't kill the ants that are going to the bait or the bait station. If you do that, the bait never makes it to the nest and it doesn't work. Don't spray them uh, when they're in the windowsill. If you've got the bait out, let the bait take its time to work, and eventually you will dwindle their, their population down to a point that you're just not going to see them anymore. For other ants, you might have to switch to something like a hot shot ant bait or a couple of others that are on the market. These are more protein based. So instead of being sweet with sugar water like taro, they have this higher protein content. Ants have different needs at different times of the year. Even the, the odorous house ant will eventually want protein. When they're waking up from the winter, many ants want these sugary materials because it helps to energize the nest. And then when they're reproducing, when they're trying to make more uh, ant workers or new ant reproductives, they're going to want that protein. That's just a very quick overview between some of the more common ants that you might see at this time of the year compared to termites. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it here today with you. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And I was going to see if there was any questions or anything I could answer here. Jonathan, while they're thinking about their questions, I wanted to, to show something off. What carpenter ants do isn't always a bad thing. I was getting firewood from an ash tree in my uncle's yard, and the center of that ash tree, they had totally um, yeah. made a gallery in it, and it was beautiful. It, it kind of looked like uh, something you would see uh, in the ocean. Uh, yeah. With this big, um, I don't know, coral type thing, but uh, real pretty. I don't know if that's showing up totally or if it's morphing yeah, out. When it's in front of you, I can see it. No, that's, that is beautiful. And yeah, I can see inside the, the end of it, but uh, really cool. Yeah. I didn't mention it, but they are also just like the termites. They're a part of that decomposition process. They help to process these logs and things that fall down. 
Uh, there's fungi and other stuff that help, of course, but these are really important critters in the landscape. It's just unfortunate that sometimes they cross our path. So on, on the termites, if a person sees that they have them and we don't know how long they've had them, that they've got um, months or so, uh, or maybe even a year to try to find a good reputable company to treat, correct? Yes. This is not something that's happening overnight. Your house isn't going to fall in on itself. Uh, you have time to find a company, to find somebody that you want to work with and trust. Uh, and they'll be able to also give you a timeline of, you know, here's when I can come out. Here's when I can do this. Uh, it It's not going to happen overnight. And this is something that we don't recommend that people try to treat themselves. And there's a reason for that. Do you want to <laughs> talk about why that is? Yeah, I mean, there are materials out there that are advertised as at-home treatments for people to use, DIY termite treatments. For termites, it's just, it's such a specialized issue. You have to get the product where they're moving through. And even the professionals, sometimes it may take them one or two tries uh, because of just how sort of crafty the termites are, for lack of a better term. So if you do it yourself, you, you're going to have to do a lot of follow-up inspection. You need to make sure that the damage isn't spreading. You're kind of putting a lot on the line and trusting your ability to do the DIY treatment properly. Uh, otherwise, they may continue to cause damage over the ensuing years. So we really do strongly recommend a professional. They're going to be able to get into places that you can't to do a better inspection. They know what they're looking for. They're well-trained. And then the treatment options that they have are just much more targeted. They're much more, they're longer lasting uh, and more effective than doing a barrier treatment yourself with a termiticide. So if you fail on an ant treatment, uh, all you have is an annoyance. If yes. you fail on a termite treatment, you've lost your house. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're getting house stolen from you by termites. Very good. Well, thank you, Shad. I appreciate this opportunity to talk about these. I know that they're big things that pop up in people's lives. So hopefully this has been helpful to folks. Dr. Larson, thank you for being on here with us to, uh, today. Uh, hope everyone has a, a great rest of your day. Uh, thank you for doing a great job. Have a good one.